Well, good day, folks. My name is Holger Neubauer, and I'm the preacher of the Church of Christ at Lakeshore in South Haven, Michigan. And today I want to talk to you about the prophet Micah. His message, delivered about 20 years before the Assyrian captivity. The Assyrian captivity took place in 722 B.C. He prophesied about 742 B.C. And we want to pay special attention to the fact that Micah is a prominent prophet dealing with the last days of the Old Covenant people. And he will specifically mention those last days in Micah chapter 4, 5, 6, and 7. But before we unpack the book of Micah, we want to remind ourselves of what Peter said in Acts 3 and verse 24, that Samuel and all the prophets that follow after, as many as have spoken, have foretold these days. And he, in, he was in the last days of the old covenant people. Hebrews 1 verse 1, God who at sundry times and in diverse manners, spoke unto time past, unto the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. They were in the last days. The last days that had begun with John the Baptist preaching in the last days of Malachi 3 and 4 would end with the consummation of the age at the fall of the temple in AD 70. And in Acts chapter 2, Peter specifically says that the Holy Spirit, which was being poured out in the last days, was being fulfilled as he spoke, which was the guarantee of salvation until that awesome day of the Lord, where the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light until the awesome day of the Lord uh, come, and then it shall come to pass that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord would be saved. That would be the result of the completion of the covenant, that all men became amenable at the time that the gospel was preached to all of the world, and at that particular point, the covenant would change, not at the cross, not on the day of Pentecost, as many suppose. And so Micah deals with the last days as well. Micah is a contemporary of Isaiah, also Hosea and Amos and Jonah. And I've already dealt with Hosea, Amos, and Jonah as they prophesied before the Assyrian captivity, all of them prophesying their messages in a 40-year span before the Assyrian captivity, which also sets forward a type. And so let's delve into the book of Micah. Micah predicts that Samaria would be plowed like a field in Micah 1 and verse 6. This would be fulfilled when the Assyrians would come. The kingdom is already divided, and now we find Samaria representing the ten northern tribes. They would be taken off into captivity. And yet Micah also predicted that Jerusalem would be plowed like a field. And Jeremiah quotes from Micah 3 verse 12 in Jeremiah 26 and verse 18 and applies it to the fall of the temple in 586 BC when the Babylonians came. And so Micah of Moresheth, that's the southern kingdom city, announces judgment to the north, but also judges uh, judgment to the south. And yet we find that God is not done with his people at the Assyrian captivity or the Babylonian captivity. He still has a plan. And in the last days of his people, God would create a new kind of kingdom and a new kind of rule. And Micah predicted in the last days that the mountain of the, uh, of the Lord's house would be built in the top of the mountains. That's Micah chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Now, in a prophetic text, a mountain simply has reference to a nation and a government. God called uh, Babylon, you destroying mountain in Jeremiah 51 and verse 25. <clears throat> and a mountain refers to a nation and its governing authority. So in the last days of the old covenant people, God was going to establish in his own mountain a kind of nation and a rule in his own house that would be 
above all of the mountains or the nations of the world. And so his rule and authority would rule supreme through his house, which would be his church. And again, in 1 Timothy 3 and verse 15, we find that Paul writes to Timothy and says, if I am delayed, I'm writing to you so you know how to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth, 1 Timothy 3 and verse 15. And so in those last days, the governing authority of God would be manifest through his house, which is his church. And again, in prophetic texts, when we have a picture of a mountain, we have reference to a nation and an authority and a kind of rule that that nation exerts. We find in Revelation chapter 6 and verse 16 that in those last days, the people would say mountains fall on us. They weren't asking for the mountains to come to squash them, but to give them protection, but they couldn't find protection. Jesus, in a context about the fall of the temple, when he curses the fig tree, you remember Mark chapter 11, he curses the fig tree. It has no real fruit. It has leaves, but no fruit. Perfect picture of God's people. They pretended to be God's people, but they weren't. Jesus cleanses the temple. When he comes out of the temple, the fig tree is cursed. And that sets forward an inclusio or an envelope argument about what Jesus was referring to. And that was the fall of the temple. Jesus would use the fig tree as the sign of the nation in the Olivet Discourse. But then he says this in that same context, in verse 23 of Mark 11. If any of you have faith, you would say to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea. Now, he wasn't speaking literally. He wasn't talking about rocks and dirt here when he says mountains into the sea. What? Some mountain in Palestine? Mount Zion would be thrown into the Atlantic Ocean somewhere? Or the Mediterranean Sea? No, no. The mountain has reference to the mountain of the government of Judaism, and yet it would be thrown into the sea. They should have been praying for that. As the Gentiles approach the land by the sea, the Gentiles always are depicted as the people in the sea, and one day the sea would be converted to the Lord in Isaiah 63 through 5. And so that's the significance of Mark chapter 11 and verse 23. And it's all one context about the fall of the temple. So that's how the word house is used and the word mountain is used. And of course, the house of God is the church. The last days are already operating in New Testament times. And clearly, God's authority was ruling through the church because that's how the world became aware of God's authority through the kingdom that God was establishing. Now, Micah says in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house would be established in the top of the mountains. And he says in verse 3 that they would beat their swords into plowshares. And someone says, when has that ever happened? When has there not been war upon the earth? Well, you see, the emphasis is upon God's kingdom. And the kingdom now is going to take a radically different kind of approach to protecting its spiritual realities. And so in the kingdom of God today, we have a kingdom of peace and we don't defend ourselves with military might. We don't have a land that we protect like the land of Israel, where they, as they had in times past geographical boundaries, which they protected. We don't have that today. We have a spiritual reality. We have a new land, a new Jerusalem, that's the church. That's the spiritual body of Christ. And we are not to defend it with physical weapons. The weapons of our war, warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds and imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. New King James says arguments. New, uh, Old King James says imaginations. The concept is to be able to throw down false teaching, to recognize God's kingdom is within, and to be able to combat for God with our spiritual weaponry, 
not with swords. And so when Jehovah Witnesses or Mormons come to the door, we don't try to cut their heads off. At least we shouldn't. I door not quite often. I'm going to go, Lord will, in just a little bit after I'm done with you. And I don't expect for anyone to get a gun out and shoot me because of my different views. But nevertheless, some perhaps would be tempted to do so. The truth of the matter is God's kingdom and God's emphasis is upon his kingdom. We, we have a peaceful kingdom today. And that's the emphasis of Micah chapter 4 and verse 11. Now I find it interesting that in these last days we have this birth pang theme set for, uh, forward once again in Micah 4 verse 10. And so in the last days where we have this peaceful means of the kingdom being established, we have also the birth pangs. And the birth pangs, that uh, program or that theme, motif, always refers to national judgment. It did in Isaiah 13 and verse 8, where the Medes were coming and the Babylonians fell in 539 BC. Isaiah uses that phrase birth pangs when the nation of Babylon fell and a different reality overtook the world and then the Medes ruled and they allowed the Jews to return back to their homeland and heaven and earth would be shaken and the earth would be removed out of her place in that time and so it depicts national judgment the same thing in Jeremiah chapter 48 with Moab and then Edom in Jeremiah 49 when those nations would fall, they would experience birth pangs. And in birth pangs, the pangs become more severe and closer together before, of course, a child is born. And this is a picture of a new reality of a nation being born. Well, the same figure is used with Micah in the last days. But this was the time that the church was being established upon the earth. And of course, they uh, were added to the church in Acts 2.47 after their baptism. And that church continued to be added to until that church, which was in its infancy stages, grew up and completed itself into the true kingdom of God. And uh, today we have the fulfilled kingdom, but the birth pangs particularly applied to AD 30 to AD 70 to the last days of the Jewish age. Now, Jesus uses the phrase birth pang. In Matthew 24 and verse 8, these are the beginning of the sorrows or birth pangs. And he's clearly talking about the fall of the temple in Matthew 24. And when we read of the birth pangs in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, they're not a different set of birth pangs. For the church of Thessalonica was being persecuted by the Jews. You can prove that by Acts 17 verse 8. They troubled the people of Thessalonica. First and Second Thessalonians were the two earliest letters written in the church, 51 and 52 A.D., and they were being persecuted by the Jews. And the church of Thessalonica started in the synagogue, according to Acts 17, 1 through 3, and their persecution came from the Jewish leadership. And so they were troubling the church. And yet they would be repaid with a kind of trouble and tribulation they were given the Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians 1 and verse 6. And so God would repay with tribulation those who give you tribulation, literally. And he was coming. And he was coming to destroy this man who was sitting in the temple of God as the man of sin. And that was the high priest. And the Thessalonians were enduring these terrible birth pangs. And so Paul says, when they say uh, peace and safety, who said peace and safety? That was the Jewish leadership. Then sudden destruction shall come upon them like labor pains upon a woman. They would be thrown into the great tribulation, the travailing which got worse and worse and worse before the coming of Christ in A.D. 70. So the birth pangs has reference to national judgment in which a new reality would be birth, uh, born after one nation fell. And we find that theme being picked up again in Micah chapter 4 and verse 10. Then in that context of the last day theme, where God was establishing on the top of the mountains, his own mountain and his own house, in a time of birth pangs, we find that there would be a deliverer that would be born in Bethlehem that would come to the Father. 
Now in Micah chapter five, there is one Jerusalem judged. He had laid siege against us, and yet one Jerusalem would be revealed by this man who was born in Bethlehem. So let's listen to what the prophet has to say, Micah 5, 1 and 2. Now gather yourself in troops, O daughter of troops. He has laid siege against us. They will strike the judge of Israel with a rod on the cheek. But you, contrasting, all right, here's a judgment. But you, Bethlehem Ephrata, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me, a ruler whose goings forth have been from of old and from everlasting. Now, what is he saying? This is the consummation of the rule. The one who was born in Bethlehem. Who was born in Bethlehem? Jesus was born in Bethlehem, the city of David. He was born in Bethlehem. And he will come forth to me. Who's me in the passage? That's the Father. This is when the Son delivers the kingdom back to the Father. Not to quit ruling in the kingdom, to consummate the kingdom. In Luke 1, 33, he would rule forever and ever. In Revelation eleven fifteen, 15, the kingdoms of this world became the kingdom of our God, and he would rule forever and ever. And in Revelation chapter 11 and verse 15, where we find that the kingdom being consummated is the same concept of Luke 21, 31, which Jesus was referring to the fall of the temple there. And he says, when you see these things happening, know the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. And in Revelation chapter 11 and verse 8, the city which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified, was punished. And so we have the same theme happening again. All right. So Jesus was coming. He was coming to the Father to consummate the kingdom. And that is exactly the force of 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 24. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts all rule of, uh, down all rule, authority, and power. What rule, power, and authority? The rule, the power, and the authority that was manifesting itself through the old covenant authorities. He's not referring to uh, Vladimir Putin. And Kim Ju In Un. He's not referring to world leaders. He's not referring to Joe Biden here. All right. He's referencing the authority of the leadership of the law in which the man of sin was revealed. And that was the high priest in the old covenant world. And the law would come to an end. And all power and authority now had transitioned under the rule of Christ. And that did not take place until the gospel went to all the world, in order that all the world could be judged by the gospel. And so, when the prophet says, he will come to me, he didn't say he's coming to you. He comes to me. This is when he delivers the kingdom back to the Father, which is synchronous with the second coming and the resurrection, the gathering together of the elect, you see. That's what he is referencing here. Now, he says during this time that there was no cluster to eat, Micah 7, verse 1. It's a time of famine as well. What Jesus said in the Olivet Discourse, there would be famines. <clears throat> Matthew 24, verse 7. Verse 8, this is the beginning of the sorrows. Well, in Acts chapter 11, Agabus, you remember the prophet who prophesied about the great drought and famine to come. And so the disciples determined to send relief to the poor saints in Jerusalem because it was going to affect all of Palestine first, you see. And then, of course, outside of Palestine, you remember in Revelation 6, in verse 6, that a man would buy a quart of, a, a, a quart of wheat for a denarius. Well, a denarius is a penny, and a man made a penny or a denarius after one day's work, according to Matthew chapter 20 which means that a man would spend all of his income on his food. And that's what took place before Jerusalem fell. The great time of trouble, the birth pangs, it's Jeremiah chapter 30, verses 6 through 9, the great trouble of Jacob, 
And Jesus said that the greatest, tri greatest tribulation period that would ever take place would take place before Jerusalem fell. Matthew 24, 21. So then there shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor, nor shall ever be. And John writes to a time when they're in the tribulation. He's in the tribulation. Revelation 1, verse 9. In Revelation 7, 14, they come out of the great tribulation. There's only one great tribulation that's unparalleled and unequal. And that took place before the temple fell in AD 70. Jesus said that it did. And so it was a time also of killing innocent people. They all lie in wait for blood, Micah 7 and verse 2. Well, in fact, Jesus said that they would have delivered, uh, you've delivered uh, to many kings and they, to the Jewish authorities, they would be crucified and uh, uh, they would be beaten in their synagogues in Matthew chapter 23. It was the time of the great tribulation, which many of them would die. Not all of them would. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10, when they persecute you in this city, flee to another, for you shall not come over the cities of Israel until the Son of Man comes. And in that context of Matthew 10, you remember what he said? That a man's foes would be of his own household. In Matthew 10, 35, and the uh, son would deliver the father, um, deliver over the father and uh, the daughter, her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. That's exactly what Micah says in Micah 7 and verse 6. For son dishonors father, daughter rises against her mother, daughter relents against her mother-in-law. What's Micah saying? This is the picture of the last days. But Jesus spoke about those last days in the context of the last generation of the old coveted people before the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. And again, in Matthew 10, 23, you shall not gone over the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. He's talking about a great persecution period. You see, not all of them would die. Most of them would but not all of them would. And so Jesus was coming to rescue, you see, to help. And that's what the coming of the Lord did as Jesus manifested himself in flaming fire in Thessalonica. All the Jewish rulers all over the world, at Corinth, at Thessalonica, in Ephesus, they believed that the law would remain. They believed that God was on their side. They went to Jerusalem for the last Passover feast. All of them went. They were to go three times in the year. Jesus told the Jewish Christians not to go into Jerusalem when they saw the armies compassed about. Not to go. All of the books of the Bible were written before 87, including the book of Revelation. It was not written in 95 and 96 AD, as the Catholic tradition suggests. That's where it came from. And here's the refutation. The last days refers to a 40-year period. And Micah says, in Micah 7, 15, as in the days when you came out of Egypt, I will show them wonders. He speaks about the last days, Micah 4, 1, and 2. He characterizes the last days through chapter 5, 6, and 7. And then he says, according to the days coming out of Egypt, 40-year period, I will show them these wonders. And what will be the result? Verses 19 and 20, you will again have compassion on us and subdue our iniquities. You will cast all our sins into the depth of the sea. You will give mercy to Jacob and mercy to Abraham, which you have sworn to your fathers from the days of old. When the Bible says Jesus was appearing a second time without sin unto salvation, that was to consummate the promises that God gave Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They were looking to the consummation of their goal. They weren't looking to the cross. That only initiated the process. They weren't looking to the day of Pentecost. Well, that was simply a sign that the process had begun. They were looking for a great consummation that would come not in the type of the Passover, which was for the hiding of sin, or the Pentecost, which was the first fruits of the gathering, but the Feast of the Tabernacles, where the Day of the Atonement was attached to. 
where Israel would receive its forgiveness. And when the tabernacle of God was completed, when the church was completed, and in Revelation 21, 3, where the tabernacle of God is with men, is when salvation showed up in its complete form. Now comes strength and power and the kingdom. Revelation 12, 10. And the kingdoms of this world became the kingdom of our God. Revelation 11, 15. And when you see these half things happening, know that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Re uh, Luke 21, 31. And that's the day of redemption. Luke 21, 28. When Jesus came in the clouds with power and great glory. Luke 21, 27. There's only one second coming. It took place when Jerusalem fell. And Micah, like all of the prophets, all of them who foretold these days, spoke about the last days of Israel in which Jesus would return, the kingdom would be consummated, the covenants would change, and heaven would be opened. The great goal of God is not to end all of humanity. It's not his goal. It never was. It was to end a system that couldn't open heaven. And so in the 40-year transition, AD 30 to AD 70, it was just like the transition coming out of Egypt. That's what he says in Micah 7, 15. As in the days when you came out of Egypt, I will show them wonders. The miracles were for 40 years. And the type is Joshua chapter 5. After the 40-year transition, they enter, the land, enter into the land. The manna ceases the day they after they enter into the land. That's a picture of the spiritual gifts coming to an end. God rolls away the reproach of Egypt. That's when salvation came to those who were wandering. The redemption finally came. He rolled away the reproach of Egypt. They circumcised again. Circumcision came uh, in the land. It had a new meaning to them. And who did Joshua meet? He met a man with an outstretched stretched sword. And he told Joshua, take the sandals off your feet for the place where you worship is holy ground. And Joshua worshiped and can't worship a created angel. So he met Jesus at the end of the 40-year period. And all the prophets from Samuel that follow after, as many as have spoken, have foretold these days, the last days of the old covenant people in which Jesus would return. And those miracles were for 40 years. Just like 1 Corinthians 1, 6 through 8 says, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall confirm you to the end. That's the end of 1 Corinthians 15, 24, and 1 Peter 4, 7. That you might be blameless in the day of the Lord Jesus. The spiritual gifts and the infancy of the church are over. We have the completed kingdom today. And heaven is opened. And please do not argue that somehow the blood sealed covenant and the sacrifice of Christ cannot open heaven today because it has. It's the completion of God's plan. Futurists believe you got to die. There you wait for a biological, physical resurrection at the end of time. That's baloney. That's baloney. It's not true. Heaven's been opened since the fall of the temple. And if you're in heaven, why in the world would you want to be popped out, put in the ground, and then get some kind of glorified state again so you can go back to heaven? That's crazy. No, heaven was open at the fall of the temple. The miracles were 40 years, just like Micah said, Micah 7, 15. There's no miracle in your future, in anyone's future. The Bible is complete, and God only does what he needs to do in order to obtain his purposes, and the miracles have ceased. They have come to an end. The everlasting covenant is with us. God's strong providence is here. That's true. And I believe that more than ever before. But Micah, like all the prophets, prophesied about the last days of Israel, A.D. 30 to A.D. 70. You guys keep on studying. I want to remind you guys of my book, Whether That Day and That Hour. All right, you can get that on Amazon. I don't have any extra books anymore, just a few left, and uh, only two of these left. i got to order a whole new box. You can get that on Amazon, the Maranatha. And uh, I demonstrate in this last book that the Olivet Discourse is not divided, but at that day and hour. So get yourself a copy and uh, do some study, do some earnest study. 
Now remember, wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom. With all your getting, get understanding. So you guys have a great day.